All right. I'm Ann Seymour. I'm the director of the Office for Victims of Crime Oral History Project. My name is Jay Howell. I'm an attorney in Jacksonville, Florida, representing crime victims and children. Great. Jay Howe, when, why, how did you first get involved in the crime victims movement? I was a state prosecutor in Florida. I specialized in uh, child abuse and sexual crime prosecutions. That's when I started. I started to work with the community agencies, the dom first domestic violence shelter. Of course, this was back in 1976, 77 is when I started. And what led you to get more specifically involved in working with crime victims? I did a lot of the child abuse cases. I, what I started doing was going around the community talking about child abuse. Because uh, the first child abuse case I tried was a typical horror story of a kid we found with 40 open wounds on her body, the temperature was about 40 degrees, her mom was nowhere to be found. Getting into that, she was five, working her case, getting to know her, putting her on the stand is what really started me thinking from a different perspective, from that child's point of view toward the courtroom, the rules, the system, and uh, what it, of course, it changed her life because it took away her mother, who had done this to her. And um, did, did that lead you on the path to, I know you ended up having a lot to do uh, in the area of missing and exploited children. Can you tell us a little bit about how you went down that path? I left prosecution in Florida and went with a newly elected Florida Senator, Paula Hawkins, to Washington. She had an investigation subcommittee. She was the chair of it as a new senator. We started investigating, tracking serial murderers, child pornography, different kinds of things, but we focused for about two years on missing children. She wrote and passed through the Senate uh, almost by herself, the first missing children bill. We conducted extensive hearings into missing kids. And out of that work, her investigative office became a national center. We would get calls from all over the country, parents searching for their children, law enforcement training issues, trying to put any system together because in the beginning, I remember when I first sat down with the head of the FBI's national crime computer, and he said there's less than 100,000 persons, most of which are children, in this system because law enforcement just isn't using it. Of course, now if you ran that system in 2002, it's got about uh, eight or 900,000 in it, uh, most of whom are children. Wow. <coughs> and you were, excuse me, um, you were the first director of the National Center for Missing and Exploiting Kids. And could you just talk, talk us a little bit about how um, that got authorized and who was involved and what were some of the challenges you faced in establishing MX Kids? The center was created when Al Regnery, who was the head of the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, called me at the Senate, because we had done all these hearings and this work, legislative work, uh, and become kind of a junior Senate center ourselves for people from all over the country. He said, what do you think needs to be done on this issue? We've decided to put some money into it, the Justice Department has. I want you to give me a laundry list of six, your top six items of what you think should be done. I immediately called Robbie Calloway with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, an insider Washington pro, and said, what do I do with this? And Robbie said, this is serious. This means they're going to do something serious, so be careful. I sent over a list of six items, including a National Resource Center, an 800 line where people could report some resource to distribute pictures of missing kids, training for law enforcement on sex crimes against children, things like that, sent it over and less than a week later, Al Regnery called back and said, we're gonna do the first four items on your list. Now, <coughs> you could have knocked me over pretty easily then. I knew that was a substantial monetary commitment and, um, and I was surprised because up to that point, it was all, you know, People had posters of their own missing kids. One law enforcement agency up the road didn't know a child was missing uh, when, a, when a child was missing. And now when I see Amber Alerts and uh, interstate dissemination of information about children, it, it's, it's uh, scary. It, so much has happened in such a short period of time. I think the people who work in these issues sometimes lose grasp of the fact that it has been night and day inside of 30 years. 
in the history of time these problems have existed, kids being abused, sexual assault, crime victimization, but the progress that's been made and, and the technology, for instance, on the issue of missing children, I remember when we ran the first nationwide pictures of missing kids. It was the end of the first movie, Adam, that we had done some television movies about this where they had actors playing us. And at the end of it, NBC committed to running 60 pictures of missing children in prime time. Now, that had never been done. We didn't have a center at the time. We were still in the Senate running investigations. So we contracted with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to answer a phone that night, having no idea, frankly, whether anyone would call on that phone at the end of that two-hour broadcast. And, uh, of course, we were there and waiting and... Um, you know, uh, 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 good leads and, and, and uh, over a dozen kids ended up being dis found after that. But w we had no idea going into it whether it would even work as a technique. Of course, now not only is it an accepted technique for finding missing children, it's located over 700 uh, wanted fugitives. The, m America's Most Wanted sprung out of the concept of looking from, it sprung from the concept of looking for missing children. Um, this might be a weird question, but who put who started putting kids' pictures on on milk cartons? Actually, it started uh, before the center existed, and uh, there were a couple organizations involved in it. Traditional child safety organizations who distributed it, uh, they ended up putting them on wine bottles. There were a lot of different things, and it was somewhat controversial. Uh, I remember testifying once in front of the Senate or the House, uh, and I had the wine bottle with me, and I said, you know, maybe this isn't appropriate, and I felt bad because later I found out that the guy who did that was a very dedicated and decent human being who was trying hard mm -hmm. to do what he thought was the right thing. And I went on national television and uh, said maybe we shouldn't go this far because we were concerned about scaring children. We felt we could look for children without putting it on the kitchen table in front of them at breakfast, which did concern us. Kids, the, one of the most primal fears of kids is the fear of separation from their parents. And it's uh, basic and fundamental in their nature. We were always worried about that, although um, uh, it also located children. These were tough in the early days. I can remember being hauled over to the Department of Justice and told. In fact, there's a nationwide program for pictures that still exists that I said no to when it was first proposed. It was tough for us to figure out our way through all of this. We didn't know everything we know now. We didn't know what would work. We didn't know what would be too much. So we just kind of plotted ahead as a, uh, naive ignorance. You, you mentioned Robbie Calloway. Can you just talk about some of the early pioneers, specifically in the MX um, area? Well, Paula Hawkins set the tone. There was no doubt about it. She passed the Missing Children Bill. She passed the Missing Children Assistance Act that more formally set up the center as an entity. Of course, Al Regner in the Department of Juvenile Justice started this ball rolling, a fact that's very rarely mentioned. Um, we had good people who were working with us. There were parents like John Walsh and Reve Walsh and uh, Julian Stan Pates from New York City, Aton's parents, Camille Bell from Atlanta. They, they were all well-known um, cases at the time, the Atlanta child murders, Aton being mi uh, missing from New York City. And they worked, of course, as, as a host of organizations. Robbie Calloway helped uh, immeasurably inside in Washington in telling us mm -hmm because we were, really were outsiders in terms of the Beltway, what to do and how to do it. And, um, you know, I think uh, somebody asked me here, uh, d did you ever stop back and, uh, and say, you know, this has happened so fast, because it really did get going fast as a public issue in the media and all that. And I said, you know, I, when we did the first Rose Garden ceremony for the signing, Ronald Reagan signed the first Mission Children Bill, 82. Well, the White House said, told me on Friday, we're going to do this Tuesday morning. Monday was Labor Day or some holiday. You invite all the people to the, and set this thing up. So I said, okay. Uh, I'm set, and I had all these invitations from the White House that mailgrammed them in those days. I don't know if they still do. Come to this Rose Garden ceremony. Well, then I went over to drop that off on Friday evening or Saturday at one of Reagan's top staff people in Northern Virginia. And, um, and I said, do you want me to put anything down for the president or anything since... I've been working on this a long time. I know all the people who will be in attendance. And they said, yeah, why don't you draw up something for the president and leave it at the old EOB speechwriter's address on Sunday afternoon or something. So I go by and leave it at this thing. And then Tuesday morning, we're in the 
Rose Garden, and the president starts talking about this, and then he starts saying words that I had written, and I said, there's something wrong with a country that gives somebody like me this much power. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, and the only other time I felt that way was when we had the talking teddy bear, Teddy Ruxpin, oh. and he, Teddy gave us a lot of money and agreed to do child protection messages to kids yeah. like, nobody should be touching you in the bathing suit areas of your body. And, so I guess I wrote a whole script for Teddy that they had sold with him on a tape. And the first time I ever heard Teddy Ruxpin say what I written, I felt about the same way I did when the president did. I said, "There's something wrong with it. Give somebody like me that kind of, like, access." <laughs> president Reagan and Teddy Ruxpin. Teddy Ruxpin. Um, when you got involved in the field of the, you know, the general field of victims' rights and services, as well as MX Kids, describe it. What was it like when you first uh, became engaged in victim assistance? Well, see, it was the. You know, it was beef. There's a before and after that's pretty clear line of demarcation. I think history will regard that as a line, the line being drawn in the late 70s and a variety of issues. I can remember we treated, when I was a prosecutor, victims pretty much like an objective object, like fingerprints, evidence, something that we needed to use to get our convictions, but that was in the way much of the time. And um, it was a mindset that had developed because of the country's, by then, 200-year history of having public prosecutions, not private ones by the victim. So um, the system had uh, evolved into just two parties, the defendant and the state, and they pretty much uh, looked unkindly toward any outside interference. And uh, that's what the state of the, of the courtrooms then a kind prosecutor or a good judge would come along occasionally, but input formal into the system was virtually non-existent, and sometimes it was cruel. And, uh, you know, the single person whose life has been most upended by a violent crime is standing way back, far from the center, the core of activity, and um, with the system in the middle basically keeping them in arms. It was pretty bad, and it's changed so dramatically. I think we tend to say, well, we haven't done that much. We need to go farther. We've got to do things. It's to, to have the single barometer that tells us how far, to have over 30 states passed a state constitutional amendment in this kind of time frame, because those didn't really start. I think we had the first meaningful one, probably. They had other bills of rights. We had the first meaningful one in Florida. Went on the ballot yeah. in November of 88. Um, and 90% uh, of the voters in Florida voted for it because uh, it was worded so they could understand it. We were scared about that. We had no money. We made a deal with the trial lawyers to give us $10,000. We had no publicity, but the concept was appealing to the voters, so it went through. Well, when you have over 30 states have amended their fundamental governing document, their con state constitution, to put this in, uh, uh, there are very few issues concepts that have moved forward to formal recognition as quickly in our society from its inception. It really is pretty striking. That's great. Um, when you were dealing with the missing children's issue, missing and exploited kids, Jay, what was the greatest challenge that you and your colleagues faced in affecting change? Uh, attitude. There was a complacency um, that people uh, didn't see a role too much for parents. Law enforcement thought, well, these kids have run. We need to make sure that they're not a runaway before we do anything to look for them. We did investigative hearings at the Senate into the practices that existed at that time, and kids weren't listed in, this, in the national computers that were available to search. Uh, there was no sophisticated training on crimes against children, sexual exploitation, kids in court. One of the main efforts of the center in the first years, 84 to 87, when I was there, was we went state to state to the Albanys, the Sacramentos, the Tallahassees, the Austins, to lobby for a whole host of legislation that's now pretty complex, background checks on people who work with children to make sure they're not convicted crime people, child abusers, violent people, uh, screening of people who work with kids, uh, getting film processors to report it when they see child pornography, helping kids in the court so they can be questioned in 
words and phrases that are appropriate to the age of the child and so eight-year-old kids aren't asked, can you identify the perpetrator? An uh, eight-year-old girl was asked that in a Florida courtroom and of course she just hung her head because she doesn't use the word identify. It's funny when I tell that story to adults, some of them say, oh, I get that. She doesn't know what a perpetrator is. So, well, it's not just the perpetrator. She also doesn't use the word identify. Um, and the court, of course, is loaded with that. Prior to, state the facts with reference to whether or not, when you went down to that guy's house at the end of the corner that you've told us about and he opened the door to you, was there anybody else in the room? It's got about eight concepts in it, but that's pretty much common in courtrooms and kids are still victimized. That's one of the big challenges, the biggest challenge a child faces in an American courtroom now in the millennium is being questioned with concepts and words that they do not understand. So two states have laws to address that. We need all 50, and then those two that have it, Florida and California, need to enforce it, because they don't. Um, early days, what were some of the secrets and tactics and strategies that you employed, National Center employed, that were successful? Uh, or all state constitution amendment, whatever you want to talk about. We just did a uh, tribute to Paula Hawkins and all the work that she did. And one story I forgot to tell, and I should have. We were pushing the missing children bill, the first one. She was pushing it through the House and the Senate. She was a senator. The Senate approved it. The senators were in favor of it. We sat around a table with uh, Orrin Hatch and Strom Thurmond and our inspector and Paula Hawkins and Dennis DeConcini and and on the other side were the House people, Don Edwards of California. They opposed the bill, did not want the dadgum thing to go into law, which was a pretty benign piece of legislation allowing parents to ensure their kids were listed as missing in the national crime computers. Well, during this, uh, we knew the House was against it. We knew they were probably going to fight it. Linda Otto, a producer who later did the two Adam movies, had just done, we had just met her, and she had done a 2020 piece. In, in, as an independent producer on missing kids because it was getting news attention back then on missing children. So we knew Linda. Linda happened to be in Washington filming. So she brought over her cameras, set them up in the conference room where the House and the Senate were and all the lights like lighting up the room so that the members of the House knew they were on television and a documentary was being made with their votes. Had it all set up, she had the 2020 monikers in there. There was no film in those cameras. That is great. But it worked. It worked. That's great. And that's sometimes <laughs> what you have to do when you, we, we knew that would persuade them perhaps on the record and in the light of day to be more fit. Because I can remember our inspector leaning over the table and saying, now Don, to Don Edwards, why exactly do you not want this to become law? You know. Um, so, in, in, in fact, the irony of that was, we were going, years later, when we had the center and after the bill had passed, we were going around on Capitol Hill with Teddy Ruxpin because Teddy had given us a lot of money and Don Kingsborough, the head of that company, was really kind to us. And we were going around and I happened to walk by Don Edwards' office after opposing the missing children bill. And he had been, he was still in, in Congress at that time, and we walked by and there was nobody in his office. So I took Teddy Ruxpin, the doll I had, the little teddy bear, and I set Teddy in Don's office and took a picture in, in his chair. <laughs> That is so funny. Sometimes that's all, that's all you get. That's all you can do, baby. Um, um, have there been any failures in our field? You know, it's interesting. There haven't been many. I think the future holds maybe the biggest challenges because you cannot say objectively that this movement, and it is a movement because it's powered by passion and committed people, and now it has changed. It has changed fundamentally since the mid-70s because it's part of being successful. We got bigger, we got better, we got more jobs, we got more positions. Prosecutors' offices, police departments have advocates. They never had that before. And as a result of that, we have become more enmeshed in the system. I can remember when we got the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and my brother, who had worked for Governor Graham and Senator Graham and knew a lot about the system, sat down with John Walsh and I and said, life's about to change for you two guys. You've been outsiders pounding on the system trying to get things done. Now you're insiders. 
They're, you're in a part of a vehicle. You're attached to the government. You're a part of the system. Same thing happened to victim advocates because it changed in the last 15 years. We've got these people placed, but they also work for the government, and therein lies the rub. It is difficult to advocate freely and completely when you are in the public sector. I can remember at a NOVA conference uh, several years ago, we were talking about creative prosecution things for kids and investigating crimes against children and what to do, and this advocate came up to me afterward and she said, I work for a district attorney who won't do this, won't do these things. And I talked to him, and I said, well, then you have to be careful because you're walking a tightrope. We do not want to lose you to the movement because you have fallen off the tightrope because he got rid of you or limited or changed your duties because you push too hard. It is very difficult inside the government, inside an agency, an institution, you can't freely advocate. Uh, 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 I say often to people, they probably wonder why I say it, <laughs> it doesn't make much sense, I say I'm in the private sector. The reason I say that is I was in the public sector for a long time. But being in the private sector has so much more freedom of what you're able to do. A and you're limited when you're in an agency or a part of the government or even in a, um, a community-based victims' rights organization. It isn't easy to know how far you can go over that bridge before you look around and you find out it's in uh, ruin because you burned it. There's no bridge left because you burned it. And then all of a sudden, how many of our good friends have been cast adrift out there for, uh, who are no longer with us, no longer working in the field? Yeah. Mm. Um, if you had to pick one greatest accomplishment that feels 30 years old today, Jay, what's the greatest accomplishment that has promoted or propelled victims' rights and issues and needs? Well, the single greatest success is the constitutional amendments. I, I, don't, I ask me a hard one. Uh, to me, I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm immersed in the system, but I, I got to go into court. And m most of the time, when I go into court for a victim, they say, "Well, what about standing right off the bat?" Well, when you have amendments and things like that, that covers those bases. So I think there's no doubt that we have done. Re we got real good laws, re state to state. They're amazing, and we've got amendments that back them up and give them weight. That is the power, and that also, I think the second challenge, uh, the first challenge I was alluding to earlier for the future is keeping the keen edge, the sharp blade of advocacy while we grow more and more into the system, our, and our people do. And the second one is enforcement. We got real good laws. State to state, we've got excellent laws. It's night and day from the way it was 25 years ago. But enforcing that in reality, in the real courtroom, mm -hmm. having those rights mean something, that's going to be the millennium challenge, I think, is, is those two things. Keeping the advocacy edge and enforcing what's out there. We got good stuff. Um, newbies in the field, the buffalo chips, the folks who haven't been around very long, and there's a lot of them here. What advice can you, Jay Howe, give to these folks who have just recently joined our field from your experience? This is tough because life, I think, has told us that history is forgotten uh, sometimes because people come in new. It's just the nature of anything. I, I can remember John Walsh and I going back to the Judiciary Committee in the Senate to lobby for a successor missing children bill probably the Missing Children Assistance Act or something after we had left up there. And this guy who we were pounding on, <laughs> who was a staff attorney for the Judiciary Committee, and we were pounding on him to pass something. He said, well, let me tell you something. We've done a lot of work on the kind of stuff you're talking about. Let me show you. He took us into their archive conference room, went up on the wall and pulled the hearing on serial murders that I had done <laughs> with Senator Specter and Senator Hawkins about four years before that. He said, you see what I mean? We've done a lot on this. Well. Uh, John and I, of course, John would get pretty aggravated, and uh, it was amazing that nobody ever got punched out. Somebody said to me recently, you know, John's pretty volatile, and he believes so strongly. Did it ever come close? And I said, yes, it came close many times when I thought he was going to deck somebody. He got so aggravated, and of course, he had suffered the ultimate loss of his child. And, and, and the interviewer who was asking me this said, well, did you, did you hold him back? And I said, uh, no, some of those people needed punching out. <laughs> You know, we hate to, 
advocate, vi here we are advocating violence, but um, <laughs> we weren't, and of course we didn't, but it was pretty aggravating to be condescended to in those times, and I think the only challenge for the new people in the system is maintain the advocacy edge. People paid high prices to get us here in blood, sweat. I mean, look at the sacrifices that were based upon. Look at how many people made the ultimate sacrifice. Look at how many years and years we would come to conferences and the people you would see had hollow eyes because they look different. It's like a child who's been abused. You can see a different look in their eye. They, their eyes don't have the life that other children's eyes have. Well, don't forget that as this thing gets bigger that it was based on that and there were individual citizens who um, laid themselves open and exposed themselves and their pain in order to get things done. Their names, some of them are well known to us, some of them our names are not known at all to us. Um, about people who started things moving when nothing was going on, raised their hand and said, I, I don't like the way this is going, you need to treat me better. I, I don't think I'm going to be leaving until you do something for me or my family. And, and I think that being mindful of our history is uh, important because so much has happened in these three decades. Really, that's, what is it, 25 years, really? 28? That 30. This, anything's existed mm -hmm. in this field. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, a friend of mine, Andrew Sachs, who's a lawyer who writes novels about child abuse and stuff. And uh, we were doing a book signing one time, and he said, let me tell you, we have come farther in the last 30 years in terms of the abuse of children and our recognition of it than we came 4,000 years before it. That's a fact, and, I, and Andrew's a lot smarter than I am. I believe he's right. Something similar can be said for these issues, victims, general issues about victims of crime and their treatment. Um, the future of this field, um, do you have any fears or concerns? I don't really. I, I, there'll be growing pains. It's new. Um, I, I have, the only f concerns I have is that the movement not move away from, too far, from its real roots and its guts and its bone marrow and its fabric. Mm. And there's a lot of pain there. It is tough. Look at all. It's so tough to work in this. But you still need, because I, I really think the system, to a large extent, is going to be populated in professionally by younger people. Mm. The only downside to that is younger people don't see the full horizon of life, the pain, the difficulties, the, the challenges that are in that immunity cocoon kind of, but <laughs> we'll always deal with that. But I feel pretty good that the legal structure, the amendments and the statutes that are on there, they're not going to evaporate. Nobody's going to take them off. Mm -hmm. That structure alone will save us. It may have been the smartest thing we ever did. Um, I, I want to ask you a question that wasn't on the question list. Um, civil litigation, you, you demand. Um, you are considered one of the early pioneers, um, and a, a lot of people um, who will be utilizing this, the resource of the Oral History Project, um, may not understand what it's all about. And I know it's, I mean, it's uh, just a, a, a summary of what civil litigation on behalf of crime victims means, and maybe if you could give a very concrete case, as I know you do so well, Jay. It has helped victims, I, I, to almost to a person. I've done hundreds of cases, but I don't find them people who are motivated by money. Sometimes we're able to ask for policy changes. We feel certain that the apartment industry, the motel industry, are materially safer because of civil claims they've had to or their insurance carriers have made them become more conscious of this, which our goal was always safety and, and health. But, um, it has helped individual victims because they've been able to take a horrible situation and maybe put education, college education, retraining, some financial security, a home is a very important to many people, particularly who've been victimized in an apartment or something. 
So it helped people through a lot of stuff, but we hoped it moved public policy forward. And um, we ask for policy changes that, uh, and, and, and some of the victims have been really good about saying, look, um, it's not about money. It's about you as a commercial institution in our town knowing what's going on crime-wise around you and reaching out and finding information that you're really legally obligated to do. So um, every now and then those cases can be very significant in terms of rights. We filed privacy actions on. They're not always about money. Sometimes they're about privacy, children's privacy. They're about the protection of kids. They're about getting policy changes in child-serving agencies and making them do certain things. Uh, civil litigation is, um, has, has a positive angle to it. I wish it was present more often, but um, it can be very helpful in a life that's been, where control's been removed because it does restore some control and uh, some power and some ability to change your life for the positive. And that's nice to see when you're working with somebody who you've only seen laugh once, and that was very recently after going through all of the experiences that they do, and then finally something good happens and you see part of that personality restored. Mm -hmm. The um, two strongest statements I have ever heard in the movement, uh, both are about sexual assault. One is by a medical doctor in Mississippi. And I've not heard of her before or since. This is about 10 years ago. She describes a head-on drunk driver crash that injures her, the mother of three, 17 breaks in her limbs, nine months in the hospital, cannot hold her children, horrible physical consequences. Long-term rehab, she tells that story very poignantly. At the end of it, she says, all the pain that I endured as a result of that car crash does not compare to the pain I endured when my father would come into my room every night and fondle me. The other statement I thought was our good friend in California, you know her, who was kidnapped and her arms were cut off. And years after the incident, that happened when she was 16, years after the incident, she said, I have learned to live without my hand. I have not learned yet to live as a rape. Now, the, you know, the, the depths of that are, of course, what prompts everybody to step forward and get in the movement. But that, those are the two most articulate statements I've ever heard of what all this means. Okay. Anything we didn't ask you that you want to add? I think... Up till now, 2002, there has been a family fabric. We are family, and it has been good. We fight like family, but we've also been family. And I hope for those young people in the future that they got some of that family fabric that we do, because it'll sustain you in your time of need. Great. And um, you mentioned earlier that you had a story about Bosco. We'd, we'd like to hear that. Not about Bosco, so I was going to tell Bosco. Oh. Um, actually, um, uh, the, um, it, it was a story that can't be told publicly because some of the things that happen in the victims' movement are, are uh, better left, you know, uh, to go, go to our graves with us when we do. And, I, and some of them are, are like that. But the presence and the feeling here at ANOVA conference of family, the problem is I see it does concern me, fewer and fewer people from the old family coming back all the time. And that's troubling. I, I don't know about you, but that's troubling to me. Um, because there, when you fight on the barricades with somebody for a long period of time, it engenders a special bond. It is different when you fight on the barricades and you've been out there uh, because the successes were never guaranteed in this. This has been pretty tough hedgerow fighting, hedgerow by hedgerow, just like Normandy was. And um, I, if we could hold everybody together, uh, 
would be nice, wouldn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, well, we've not always been good on all the things that we've done, and there have been the normal human frailties follow us around, too. We're just people, you know? We're just people, and uh, we're, we don't do everything that we're proud of, uh, but uh, we hope that the fabric still stands and holds up, you know? Mm -hmm.